ended service yesterday with uh, with prayer for revival, and uh, we, as we went along with that, we sung "Revive Us Again," and I think we need to do that again tonight. So let's let's stand and sing hymn number one fifty five, and then we're gonna sing all four verses. Out. Just remain standing and have a word of prayer tonight. And certainly good to see you on Monday night. And I told Preacher Gammons and so I just spoke to him. And, and I said, uh, we're, we want revival. And I said, it's going to be easy preaching. You're going to be preaching to people that wants to hear somebody preach. Amen. <laughs> I've been here trying to do it, but they're real hungry for some preaching. Amen. And, uh, but uh, we're praying and we're excited being in the service, and we're glad you're here tonight, and it is wonderful to be here, isn't it? And uh, Preacher Gammons, I'd forgot the, how long it had been. He said he'd, it was in 2017 he was here, so that's been a little while, and it's good to be back, have him back with us. And let's pray tonight and ask the Lord to help us, and uh, meet with us in a special way. Maybe somebody has something just spoken to be uh, prayed about you'd like to mention. Well, I tell you, it's just good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? And uh, I'm excited about being here. Preacher Lord, how about praying for us tonight, would you? Amen. Appreciate the prayer. And again, certainly good to see you, and we welcome you here tonight. And I might mention this uh, of interest to all of our people here at, uh, at Bethany. And uh, uh, Brother Adam, I'd ask him uh, the first Sunday, in, in a couple of Sundays, and the first Sunday in May, uh, to give us a report of the trip there, the mission trip to India. So uh, you be praying for him. And I just asked him a little about it. He was telling me a few things. And he said, Preacher, it's still unfolding. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just wonderful and great what the Lord's done there and that. So he'll be giving us a report on that. And you pray for him. And uh, just good to be here. And then I'm excited about being here in the service. And we're just going to give him all the freedom he needs tonight. We're praying for him. Been praying for you now. The church has been praying. And uh, I appreciate the prayers and the concern. And uh, so we're excited about what the Lord has for us. Again, we appreciate you being here. And it's just good good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? And preacher, you, I want you to just follow the Lord and close out the way the Lord leads you. And you just, uh, you, you're at home here. And uh, I'll say this in relation to Preacher Gammons. 
he uh, the first time I uh, first time I ever heard him preach was uh, I think well I used to hear him preach on TV son and uh, for the first time and then I heard him preach uh, the funeral for preacher Leon Michaels and preacher Leon is one of my mentors and uh, I, 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 he and I were talking sometime I remember his sermon the points that he had in the sermon. And uh, so we both discussed that a little, and we figured either it was a good sermon or I had a good memory, or I think both maybe. And uh, so it was such a blessing. But after we had met and and, uh, and and he'd come here and preach and so on, and I'd call him on occasion and speak to him, and sometimes he'd call me. And so he said this to me. He said, Preach, I'm praying for him, praying for you every day. So... He and I just became friends in and, uh, and the Lord, and I praise the Lord for that. He's special to me. And uh, preach, won't you come and just preach, and we're glad you're here. Well, let's open our Bibles tonight, please, if you will, to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 12, very first book of the Bible. And I want to read uh, three verses here in just a minute, and then I'll ask, if you will, to leave your Bibles open and follow me along as uh, we kind of work through this text tonight. Genesis chapter 12. I think everybody in here is familiar with the Bible, knows that Genesis is the first book, and, and uh, so I'll preach from this text tonight. It's good to be back again. Man, it's been a long time since I've been up here, and, and uh, it is so good to be back again. I love your preacher. I pray for Ms. Elmore. I know they've both had a lot of uh, physical problems, and I'm not lying. I'm not lying to him when I tell him I pray for him. I got his name and my call log on my phone, and then I got his name on my prayer list here in my Bible as well, so I try to pray for him. And as I pray for him, I think of you and think of this church and to thank God for your testimony and this good place. One of the prettiest churches I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you come up that old crooked mountain and it's so dark and then you get up here in the light and right here on top of this hill is this pretty church sitting here and uh, I am just honored to be back again and to be a part of the first revival meeting since the days of COVID. And uh, that, that's a blessing in itself. I'm honored and humbled to be here and uh, thank you preacher for inviting me to come back. I saw some of the other preachers up there as well and I don't know the, the Thursday night one but I know the Friday night one and a Brother Lawson, and so he'll be a blessing, I know. And preacher said about the Leon Michaels' funeral, I don't think it was the message. I just think he has a good memory. And uh, so uh, uh, that's a blessing, praise the Lord. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for praying for us and the emphasis on revival. And I hope I can be a blessing in these days. I, uh, heard, about this, um, I heard about this old boy, and I don't know why it is, preacher, but everybody who dies and goes to heaven, ain't, ain't a shred of evidence, uh, of scriptural evidence for this. But you know, we always start the jokes off. Well, somebody died, went to heaven, and met St. Peter at the gate. Well, I heard about this old boy that uh, he, uh, he, he died, got to heaven, and St. Peter met him there at the gate. And he said, uh, you want to go in? And he said, yes, sir, I want to go in. And St. Peter said, well, why don't you tell me why I should let you in? And he looked back at old St. Peter and he said, well, he said, just be honest with you. He said, I tried to do the best that I could do while I was down there on the earth. And uh, St. Peter looked at him and he said, well, give me an example. And he said, well, he scratched his head a little bit. He said, uh, he said just the other day uh, I was in a restaurant and he said, I could tell something was wrong when I got there. Walked in, said there was a bunch of motorcycles sitting in the parking lot. And he said, I walked in. And he said, you could just tell something was wrong in there. So he said, I took my seat and I sat down. And he said, I got to notice it. And he said, there were 32 hell's angels sitting in there. And he said, oh, my soul. And he said, I got to notice it. One of them was up at the cash register picking on the little elderly lady that was running the register. And he said, I just watched it. And he said, finally, I just took all, all I could take of it. He said, man, it made me mad. He said, I just went up there and grabbed that old boy by the collar, spun him around, and punched him right in the face and said, you and your buddies need to get out of here. St. Peter said, man, that is an amazing story. He said, how long ago was that? He said, about two minutes. <laughs> now, that's funny. You can laugh. That's funny. <laughs> I heard about this other old boy. Uh, one time, and he, he lost his job, and boy, he's just so discouraged about it. And he was uh, walking downtown one day, and he walked by the First Baptist Church, and they had a sign out in the yard that they needed a maintenance man. 
Well, he was looking for a job, and he thought, man, I might as well go in there and talk to somebody. So I walked in the office. The secretary met him. said, can I help you? He said, yes, ma'am. He said, uh, I know y'all are looking for somebody who's a maintenance man. He said, I'd like, to, I'd like to be considered for that job. And she said, well, wonderful. And she uh, had an application, turned it around, slid it to him, said, just fill this out and bring it back to you and uh, bring it back to us and maybe somebody will get in contact. He said, ma'am, I, I tell you this, but I can't read nor write. She said, you can't read nor write? He said, no, ma'am. She said, then you can't be the janitor here at the First Baptist Church. Well, he got his feelings hurt. He walked outside and he thought, what in the world am I going to do? He reached in his pocket, preacher, and he had a dime in his pocket. And he looked across the street, and there's an old boy over there selling some apples. And he walked over there, and he bought a dime's worth of apples from that man. And he thought to himself, he ate one, thought to himself, I wonder if I could sell these apples and make a little money. So he just went a couple of places, and sure enough, sold those apples and made a little money. He went back, bought some more apples, sold them, went back some more. Finally, he wound up with a million dollars. Yeah. And he kept it all in a grocery bag under his bed. And he thought, one of his friends told him, you better not keep that money at home. That's dangerous. So he goes to the bank with that big old sack of money, slides it up on the counter, and he says, ma'am, I'd like to put this money in your bank. Said it's a million dollars here. She said, a million dollars. He said, yes, ma'am. She said, we'll ha be happy to help you. And she said, if you'll just fill this card out and uh, give it back, we'll, we'll take your money. He said, ma'am, I hate to tell you this. I can't read nor write. She said, you can't read nor write and you are a millionaire. She said, what would you be if you could read or write? He said, janitor down there at that First Baptist Church. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to kill some time because I want us to stay till 8 o'clock. And uh, I'm not going to preach but about 30 minutes and I don't even have a watch on. So I don't even know. I, there's no clock in here. If I go long, it's y'all's fault. Maybe I ought to preach tonight. I, I'm going to mess up here. Uh, thank you for being here. I love you. I won't preach. You know, somebody said that's what Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband. I won't keep you long. So I'm not going to keep you long if you'll come, and I'll try and hopefully be a blessing. I want to read three verses tonight. Look at Genesis 12. I want to read verse 7, verse 8, and then in chapter 13, I want to read verse 4. All right, let's read this. Now look at verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram. Now Abram is eventually going to become Abraham. And uh, Omaze Jackson one time said this, said he was Abram and then he started tithing and God put a ham on the end of his name. And maybe if we tithe, God would put a ham on the end of our name as well. Can I have an amen? Oh, well, that's another message. I didn't hit a snag there, preacher. Let's get off that. Let's move on. Look at verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he, Abraham, an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now look at verse 8. And he, Abraham, removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he, Abraham, built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now look over at chapter 13, if you will, and look at verse number... Oh, well, let me read verse 3. And he, Abraham, went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai unto the place of the altar where he, Abraham, had made there at the first and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now I want to ask you to leave your Bibles open tonight. I want to preach from these three verses. All right? And it won't take me long if you'll just bear with me for just a moment. Let's pray. Father, would you bless tonight our time together? I know the preacher out of a burden of his heart has scheduled a revival meeting. Lord, he, as the pastor, senses the need for his church to have a few nights just set aside where somebody other than he could come and preach the Word of God. Lord, not that he doesn't preach the Bible. We know he does. But Lord, sometimes it just is a, a refreshing to hear it from somebody else. So I pray tonight that you would help me, Lord, to preach your Word in such a way that people could get it. And Lord, it would speak to our hearts and it would help us in these days in which we're living. Bless the Bible. 
bless the, the message tonight and speak to our hearts. And Lord, whatever happens, we're just going to say, God, be the glory. Uh, to Jesus, be glorified and honored and speak to us and help us tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text tonight is about a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham, on three separate occasions, is called the friend of God. Can I stop tonight and just say that I want to be the friend of God? Hey, can I tell you something tonight? I want God to be my friend. You know, the Bible says of Jesus that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We're talking about Abraham, and Abraham was called the friend of God. Three separate occasions in the Bible he is called the friend of God. Now, if you'll notice in our text tonight, as we're thinking about the life of Abraham, there is a common denominator to the three verses that I read tonight. And that common denominator, that one word that is found in all three verses that I read tonight is the word altar, altar. In fact, can I tell you this about Abraham? Abraham was known basically by two things that he had in his life. First of all, he was known by his tent, and second of all, he was known by his altar. Now let me say this, his tent reflected his attitude toward this world. You see, Abraham realized he was just passing through this old world. He was not to get too bogged down, too weighted down with the cares of this world. So the word of God said that he dwelt, it says there in verse number 8, that he dwelt in a tent that reflected his attitude toward this world. You know, as God's people, we're cautioned many times throughout the Bible not to become too enamored, not to become too attached to this world that we're living in. You know why? This world's not our final home. Hey, we're just passing through this old world. You know, if I live to be seven, I just turned 60 years old. My wife told me the other day, I'm so glad you're 60 because you've been turning 60 ever since you turned 59 years old. So I've turned 60 years old. I know I'm getting old, friend. And I know this, I've got more Christmases behind me than I do in front of me. And I know, man, I don't, I'm not long for this world. But I'll tell you this, I don't want to become too attached to this world that we're living in. You know why? Because this world's not my home. This world is not my home. Can I tell you something about this world? Everything in this world one day is destined to be burned up. In fact, the Bible said over in the book of Peter that the world is going to pass away with a great noise and a fervent heat. Now, in our day, of course, we understand there are some people who believe that this world started with a big bang. They call it the big bang theory. But I'll tell you, bless your heart, this world didn't start with a big bang, but it's going to end with a big bang. Can I have an amen? Everything about this world is destined to be burned and to pass away, so we as God's people ought not to get too attached to this world that we're living in. His tent represented his attitude toward this world, and his altar represented his attitude toward that world. You see, Abraham knew that if he was going to stay close to God while living in this world, that he better have a place that he met with God, and that was at the altar. Can I stop tonight and ask you, do you have an altar in your life? Everybody needs a place where they meet with God. Can I have an amen? Everybody needs a place. Now, i got to stop right up front and tell you this. Now, if I'm going to have to preach and do my own amen, we are going to be here a while. So if i got to stop and then stop a little while, preach a little while, and then stop doing my own amen, and we're going to be here a while. And number two, I'm going to have to have a bigger love offering if I preach and do my own amen. So it would help me if you would just once in a while just chirp up a little bit and say, Amen, preacher. Amen. So Abraham had an altar. So here's what I want to preach about tonight. I want to preach on this thought. When a trip to the altar is needed. When a trip... To the altar is needed. I was reading a couple of weeks ago. You know, this is the allergy season. And there's a lot of people, maybe many of you sitting right here, battled those allergies from the pollen on the trees and the flowers. And this time of the year, a lot of people said, well, my allergies are flaring up. I was reading just the other week about allergies. And an allergy takes place when in your immune system, it's your, immune, your immune system reacts to some kind of foreign substance that enters your body. Now, it may enter your body through something you eat. It may be enter your body through something you inhale. It may be enter your body through something you inject. But over 100 million people in the United States, now there's only 320 million of us in the United States. That's the, uh, I'm talking about the legal crowd, not the illegals. <laughs> there ain't no telling how many illegals are around here. But... 
320 million people, 100 million of us have allergies in the United States. Boy, sometimes when we get those allergic reactions, you know, uh, when, you, uh, when you inhale something like the pollen and your eyes become itchy and watery and your throat becomes a little scratchy and you start coughing a little bit. And it's not because you got the COVID, it's because you're having an allergic reaction to something. You know, many times there's a lot of different things that people are allergic to. Sometimes people are allergic to food. You know, they, they warn you when you go out to eat at the restaurant, if you're eating uh, fried chicken, they say, boy, we cooked this in peanut oil. And if you have an allergic reaction to nuts, then you better not eat this, this chicken that's been fried in peanut oil. And there's a lot of people that have food allergies. And then some people have uh, drug allergies. You can't take penicillin. If you do, I'm telling you, you're going to get deathly sick because you're allergic to penicillin. Some people, it's latex. You know, when you go to the hospital anymore, uh, sometimes when you go visit people in the hospital and you walk into their room, before you walk in, you got to put a mask on and, and you got to put the gown on, you got to put those gloves on. And when I walk into our members' room, uh, I say, I come over here to take your time out. <laughs> oh, you'll get it later. But anyway, but some people are allergic to them latex gloves. I like to get them things and blow them up, tie them off, make balloons out of them. Carry them home, say to my grandkids, here's a balloon that Papa got for you today. They say, Papa, I don't look like no balloon we ever seen with all them things sticking out of it. But some people are allergic to latex. Other people are allergic to insects. Maybe somebody sitting in here tonight. If you got stung by a bee, you've got to have a shot immediately or there's a danger you may die from that. All kind of allergic reactions that people face. But here's one that I think they left off the list, and that is many of God's people have become allergic to the altar. I mean, when you, when you think about coming to the altar, you break out in hives. Your eyes start swelling shut. You get a scratchy feeling in your throat. And sad but true, many of God's people have become allergic to the altar. But i got to stop and say this tonight. I think you'll agree with me when I say this. Everybody needs to make a trip to the altar once in a while. Can I have an amen? You know, some, I've been pastoring Woodland Baptist Church for 27 years. And we got some of the best people in the entire earth are members of our church. But I promise you, preacher, in those 27 years, there are some people that are members of our church in 27 years have not come to the altar. Not one time. Now, i got to tell you something. I don't worry about people who come to the altar all the time. Somebody, somebody say, yeah, don't, you get, uh, don't you get worried about that crowd that's constantly having to come to the altar? I don't worry about that at all. But I'll tell you what I do worry about. I do worry about people who never come to the altar. I don't know about y'all, but I'm thinking 27 years, there's got to be something that convicted your heart enough to get you out of your seat and down the aisle to the altar. There ought to be a tug somewhere on the other end, friend, that ought to be calling you to make a trip to the altar. I stopped. This, I said all that to say this. Man, everybody needs to make a trip to the altar once in a while. How long has it been since you made a trip to the altar? Let me tell you what the real problem is. It's not that they're allergic to the altar. They're just afraid of what other people are going to think about them. Can I have an amen? How many of us, how many of us hold back on things that we know we ought to do just because we're worried about what other people are going to think about us? Some people say, boy, if I come down there to that altar, they're going to think that I'm having problems in my marriage. Look at me. They already think that. Some people say, if I make a trip down there to that altar, people's going to leave and talk about me. They're already talking about you. Can I have an amen? You know what? We better get back to the place that we're trying to please God and don't worry what people are saying about us. Can I have an amen? Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, everybody needs to make a trip to the altar. Now, I think our church is like your church. We have an altar at Woodland Baptist Church. Can I tell you something? We have an altar that is always open at our church. In fact, I'll tell you something. If God speaks to your heart during a song, you need to come to the altar. You come to the altar during the song. It's all right with us. If God uh, speaks to your heart while we're taking up the offering, and you need to come to the altar. Well, I know a lot of people don't come to the altar during the offering. But the 
be that as it may. Hey, the altar is always open in our church. I tell our folks, Brother Roger, if they're driving down the road and, and they're driving by the church and God said, go in there and pray about something. Hey, friend, the doors are open. The altar is always open. And we ought to use the altar and do our best to stay close to God in these days, friend. Everybody needs to make a trip to the altar. Every, hey, we have an open altar, an altar that is open for uh, at all times, and we have an altar that is open at all times for anybody. Hey, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Can I tell you something? Democrats need to come to the altar. I hit a snag there. Kind of felt a little kickback. The Republicans need to come to the altar. Tell a lot of Tar Heel fans. Need to come to the altar. Can I have an amen? And Duke Blue Devil fans need a little altar. Just every once in a while make a trip to the altar. Hey, if you pull for the New York Yankees, you need to come to the altar. But if you're like me and pull for the Los Angeles Dodgers, you're all right. I'm just saying everybody needs an altar. And in our text tonight, and here's the message, and I'm done. Abraham made an altar and took a trip down the aisle to the altar. Now look in chapter number 13. Let me show you three reasons why Abraham went to the altar. And here are three reasons why maybe you need to make a trip to the altar. Maybe, maybe not all three, maybe just a couple. Maybe not even two, maybe only one. But I just want to say tonight, everybody needs to make a trip once in a while to the altar. I heard about this little boy one time. And you know how little boys are. I remember when I was growing up and in church. And, you know, man, I was, I was just mean. I was not mean. I was just mischievous. And uh, I, I, my, my attention span was very short. And, uh, boy, I, I cut up bad in church. And, boy, mama would You ain't never been pinched in your life till you get pinched by your mama when you're sitting in the Baptist church, friend. I still got bruises on my leg. Where my mama pinched me when I was growing up. Man, I'm telling you, mama would hurt me in church. And I heard about this one little boy. He, he just wouldn't be still. He was cutting up. And finally his mama just took all she could take. She grabbed him up, started to the back door. And about the time he got to the back door, he hollered out, Y'all pray for me. <laughs> and can I just stop and say tonight, ain't no one of us in here that don't need praying for. Everybody in this room, including the preacher, to the back wall. We all fight our battles. We all have our struggles. We all have our discouragements. We all have things in our life that are going on. And I'm just here to tell you tonight, everybody needs to be prayed for. And I can't think of a better place to be prayed for than when we come to the altar. Can I have an amen? Now watch this. In the Old Testament, the altar was a place. In the Old Testament tabernacle, and later on in the Old Testament temple, the first place, if you were just the average run-of-the-mill Jew, from, a, from the tribe of Benjamin or from the tribe of uh, uh, Nephtali or from the tribe of Asher or or whatever tribe other than the tribe of Levi, as far as you could go if you went to the tabernacle was the altar. The first thing that was there right in the gate of the tabernacle when you walked in to where the tabernacle was was a brazen altar. And you would bring your, your offering, your sacrifice, be it a little lamb, a turtle dove, what, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we don't have to bring those things with us to church today? I'd have had to, I would have hated to drag an old bull try to drag him up this mountain tonight and get him up here to church so I could get him offered up to God so I could be okay with God. Aren't you glad when Jesus died on Calvary and his sacrifice was a once and for all sacrifice and there's no need any further for you and I to bring a sacrifice to God other than the sacrifice of our bodies. Can I have amen? And that, that Israelite would come and he would give that priest there at the altar, he would give that priest that sacrifice. That's as far as he could go. That old priest could then go to the labor. He could walk inside the holy place. Right there was that veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of all. But in the Old Testament, the altar was a place. But in the New Testament, the altar is not only a place, the altar is a person. Can I have an amen? In Hebrews 13, 10, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, when speaking of the Lord Jesus, we have an altar. Aren't you 
aren't you glad that when we come to the altar, we're not just coming to a place, but we're coming to a person, a person that cares about us, a person that loves us, a person that's so involved in our lives that he has the very hairs on our heads numbered. He knows how many steps we've taken, how many breaths we've taken, how many times our hearts have beaten. He's so involved. He cares so much about us. When we come here, we're not coming to somebody that don't give a flip about us. We're coming to a God that loves us and concerned about us and can help us. We have an altar, friend. And when you come to the altar, you're not just coming to a place. There's more to this altar than just carpet and wood and steps. When you come to the altar, you're coming to a person, the Lord Jesus. I like to say it like this. When we come to the altar, we feel God. When we come to the altar, we find grace. When we come to the altar, we fight guilt. There's more to it. When I come here at the altar, and I know I can feel God in my seat. I get all that. But I'll tell you, there's just something special about coming to the altar and meeting with God. And God just embraces me. And God whispers in my ear, it's going to be okay. I love you. I'm, un- I'm in control. I've got this. Everything's going to be all right. I'm glad when I come to the altar, I feel God. I'm glad when I come to the altar, I find grace. And when I come to the altar, I find guilt. Amen and amen. We have an altar. And we ought to use it. Can I have an amen? Amen. I'll tell you one of the reasons our churches have got so dry. We don't come to the altar no more. Can I tell you one of the reasons that we don't see today what we used to see back yonder? I'll tell you why. We don't come to the altar anymore. Come on. Our churches are full of technology. I like the screens. Can we pick up the ball game on these TVs up here? I like me TV. Andy comes on at 8 o'clock. Can y'all turn that so we can get the Andy here? I like technology, but I tell you what, the problem with the last day's church is we're full of technology, but we've lost our tears. There's no tears shed on the altar anymore. The altars have dried up, and because the altars have become barren, our churches are in a sad state. I'm just saying we need to get back to the altar again, friend. You know why? We feel God. We find grace. We fight guilt when we make a trip to the altar. Three reasons why Abraham looked. Look at verse 7. I'm coming in for a landing now. Look at verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Number one, Abraham made a trip to the altar. Number one, when there was problems in his family. Problems in his family. Now if you look at verse 7. God is appearing to Abraham and he's making Abraham a promise about two things. The first thing he talks about is soil. And the second thing that he talks about is seed. He's talking about Abraham, I got a land for you. And it's known as the land of Canaan. Later on became known as the land of Palestine and the land of Israel. And God said to Abraham, I got a special place, son picked out for you. It involves a land. It involves some soil. And by the way, let me stop and say this. I know the Arabs are trying to take away uh, from Israel, from uh, the the Jew, all that God intended for them to have. But let me tell you something. Bless your heart. One of these days, they're going to get every square inch of soil that God ever promised to Abraham. I'm telling you, God's not through with the Jew. And someday, they're going to inherit every inch of what God promised to Abraham. It involved the soil But before God spoke about the soil, he spoke about the seed. Look at verse 7. Under thy son, under thy seed. Now, we got a problem. Hold on, 30 second time out. We got a problem because we ain't got no son yet. Abraham's 75 years old and he ain't got no son. Most of us at the age of 65 are done hanging diapers out on the line. Gotta have it unless you're superhuman. Ain't too many 75-year-olds hanging diapers out on the line. Can I have an amen? I mean, God said, hey, boy, hey Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and your son's going to inherit all this soil. Only problem, we ain't got no son. Excuse my English. We don't have a son. It's going to be another 25 years. He's going to be 100 years old. How many 100-year-olds you know hanging diapers out on the line? Can I have an amen? How many hundred years old do you know going to CBS and buying an EPT test? 
That stands for early pre pregnancy test. How many hundred-year-olds do you know that's, that's pacing the floors in the nursery room and waiting for the doctor to come out and say it's a boy or it's a girl? I don't know anybody. God said you're going to have a boy. He just didn't tell Abraham it's going to be 25 years later. Abraham probably is thinking to himself, man, there's going to be a baby on the way, but month after month after month, there's no baby. And Sarah gets frustrated. And in the meantime, he stops down in Egypt and picks up a little girl by the name of Hagar. He drags another woman into this family situation. Let me tell you something. It's bad enough that there be another woman anyway. Can I have an amen? I'm a little worried. Do I need to stop preaching about the other woman for just a minute? We do agree that once you get married, there is supposed to be no other woman than all God's people said. Amen. Now I feel better about it. Let's move on. He dragged another woman into this marital situation. Now how many of us know that it's hard enough to get two sinners to live together in unison anyway? Can I have an amen? It's hard enough. I got ten weddings this year. Ten weddings. I only have one. I got another one Thursday night. Ten weddings. I'm going to be married. I told him I'm going to marry two sinners, and y'all going to fuss and fight for the rest of your life. But let me tell you something, friend. Abraham and Sarah, he gets Hagar, brings her into the situation. Before long, look at me. He's sleeping with Hagar. Sounds like, sounds like another world. He's sleeping with Hagar. She has an illegitimate baby. Now, and Sarah can't have a baby. Can you imagine the friction in Abraham's home at supper time at night? It's probably so thick you could cut it with a knife. I mean, Sarah hates Hagar. Hagar hates Sarah. And then here comes Ishmael. Ishmael, finally 25 years later, Isaac is born. Ishmael and Isaac don't get along. There's trouble in the home. And then later on, uh, Isaac has two boys, Jacob and Esau. Once a daddy's boy, once a mom. One that lies and deceives his daddy. And then Jacob has 12 boys with all their baggage. I'm here to tell you, Abraham wrote a book on dysfunctional families. He had all kind of family problems. But let me tell you something. Right after God started talking about his family, you know what Abraham did? He picked up himself and all of his burdens about his family. And he made a trip to the altar. You know why? You feel God. You know why? You find grace. You know why? You fight guilt when you make a trip to the altar. Do I, am I speaking to somebody in here tonight? You've got some problems in your family? Maybe there's a, a, a man and a woman sitting in this room tonight and you've been having some marital issues. Maybe, you, maybe your wife says, I'll tell you, my husband is a bona fide jerk. And maybe your husband would say, she's as cold as an igloo. And you can't get along. And your marriage for the last three or four years has been in the intensive care unit, hooked up to life support, and you're saying, preacher, we've had about all we can take. We're thinking about unplugging it, pulling the plug. We're thinking about getting divorced. I understand all that, but before you do, make a trip to the altar. Hey, get up here. Pray about it. I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you're going through tonight, but I can tell you this. If there's a God in glory that can put life back into the dead body of his son after 72 hours, there there ain't nothing too hard for our God to do. And God can help you tonight. God can resurrect love in your life and love for your wife and love for your husband. God can cause it to be like it used to be. Hey, don't pull the plug. No, sir. Don't run from God. Run to God. Take a trip to the altar. God can and God will help you tonight. Amen. 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 Maybe you got problems with your children. Boy, I've never seen a time in my life when so many people are hurting over their children. I had lunch the other day. A preacher called me, Brother Roger, and he said, Brother Tim, I want to take you out to eat. I need to talk to you. And we named the place. He said, it needs to be private. I said, okay, where are we going? He called the place, and I met him there. And when we got there, his wife was there too. And we went back to the back, sat down in the booth, and I said, uh, called his name. I said, man, what's going on? I'm worried about y'all. And he said, preacher, our son just came in the other night and announced to us that he's a homosexual. He said, preacher, we never saw that coming. He said, it, it, it's, it's destroyed us. We can't sleep. We can't eat. I mean, man, 
We can't believe this is happening. And we had the boy in Christian school. Brought him up in church with hollering and fussing, preaching about everything. He's become a homosexual. And then he said this through his tears, Brother Roger. He said, my wife looked at me and said this. We might as well just accept it. And I looked back at him and I said, over my dead body, would I accept that? There's a God in heaven that can get a hold of that boy's heart. There's something called prayer and fasting and the blood of Jesus and the power of your testimony that we can overcome that. I said, over my dead body would I accept that? And maybe you sit here tonight, maybe that's your, your case. More and more in our Baptist churches, more and more young people are turning back the world and announcing they're lesbians or, or they're bisexuals or they're transgender or they're homosexuals. And friend, I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think we agree that's not God's plan. That's not God's will. Never has been. Never will be. That's not hate. I'm just preaching truth tonight. And I'm here to tell you don't accept it. Don't accept your kid. Maybe breaking your heart. Maybe you haven't even seen your kid or your grandkid and they've grown up and they've gone in a direction that you never intended for them to go. But I'm here to tell you you say preacher what am I going to do? I might as well just accept it. Over my dead body we've got an altar friend. We've got a place where we can come and feel God and find grace and fight guilt. We have well, we better use it. You know why? When there's problems in your family. Anybody got problems? Don't raise your hand. Anybody got problems in your family tonight? Anybody hurting because of your marriage? Anybody in here hurting because of a rebellious child or a grandchild? Hey, before you accept it, make a trip to the altar. Can I have an amen? Now, what time is it? You ain't going to say you're afraid to say, aren't you? I got two more points. Let me just throw this second one and preach the third one. Let's go. Number two, Abraham went to the altar when he was problemed by his family. Number two, when he was perplexed about his future. Look at verse 8. The Bible said in verse number 8, He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there built he an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham's in a pickle. He don't know what to do. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Let me give you some good advice. Come to the altar. You say, preacher, I got some decisions I gotta make. Let me give you some good advice. Don't blow it. Don't get out of the will of God. You say, preacher, how, how do I know what the Lord wants me to do? Look at me. Come to the altar. Feel God. Find grace. Find Him. Come to the altar. Can I have a name? I told those skin couples, if you're if anybody here getting ready to get married, don't raise your hand. I don't embarrass you. Ten couples getting ready to get married. I have preached and preached and preached this. You get ready to get married, you better make several trips to the altar. Can I have that? <laughs> you better make a bunch of trips to the altar. Somebody said marriage can be summed up in three words. Ideal, the ideal turns to an ordeal. And when the ordeal, ideal that becomes an ordeal, start looking for a new deal. <laughs> you ever notice this? When you first get married, you just eat one another up about ten years into what you wish you had. Uh, if you're getting ready to get married, boy, you ought to make several trips. In. You don't want to blow it. You know why? Marriage is for life. A wedding lasts 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Set the clock by me when I marry somebody. 30 minutes. I don't care how much singing they have. 30 minutes later, we're done. A, a wedding lasts 30 minutes. A marriage lasts a lifetime. And when you get married, look at me. There's no plan B. Y'all help me now. Somebody help me right here. Ain't no plan B. Amen. Amen. <laughs> there ain't no plan B. <laughs> no, it's just it's one man, one life, one wife, one life. And God's never deviated from that one plan. Right. Somebody asked me the other day, preacher, said, where does it say in the Bible the man can only have one life, one wife? I said, man, it is easy. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you got something big just down the road and you say, Preacher, I gotta make a choice about it, let me give you some good advice. Make a trip or two or three. You don't want to blow it. Not now. I've blown it enough to know that I don't want to blow it. 
make a trip to the altar, then third of all, when I'm done, when you're problemed with your family, when you're perplexed with your future. And last of all, number three, look at chapter 13, verse 4. When you're pained by your failure. Has anybody in here failed God? Let me tell you what happened. I didn't go into it all, but if you look back in verse 10 of chapter number 12, there was a famine in the land and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there. If you're a student of the Bible, you know that Egypt is a type of the world. The year of the Chaldees, the land of Canaan, that was God's will for Abraham's life. Then a famine came. Look at me. A dry time came. I don't like dry stuff. I don't like dry cake. If I cut a piece of cake and it crumbles, I don't like dry cake. I don't like dry cereal. I get my cereal when I get home from church on Sunday night, pour a bowl, stick it back in the refrigerator because I want soggy cereal. And not, cap, not stinking raisin bran either. I don't eat that stuff. It's good for me. I like Captain Crunch, Fruit Loops, Apple Jacks, Cocoa Krispies. That's my kind of cereal. And I put it in the freezer because when I eat it, I don't want it to crunch. I want it to be stringy. When I'm eating it, it's a stringy. I hate dry cake, I hate dry cereal, and I sure unto God hate dry church. How about y'all? I don't like it when it's dry. And the Bible said there came a famine of the land. Abraham went down into Egypt, and he messed up when he got down into Egypt. He lost his wife. He lied about her. Abra Pharaoh took Abraham's wife, Sarah, took her, put him in his harem. She became the wife of, a, of Pharaoh. What do you think Abraham thought every night when he walked by the palace of Pharaoh and the lights went out? I don't know what y'all have been thinking. I've been thinking, under God, oh, have mercy on me, Lord. The lights have gone out in that. He lied about her. And you know what he got for her? You look down by verse number 17 or 18, he got candles for her. Now, how many of y'all like to kiss a candle? Hug them up. Abraham lost his companion and got a camel in return for it. Man, he's blown it. He's messed up. Look at chapter 12, verse 17. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Look at me. I told you a moment ago, Abraham was the friend of God. And the Bible said the Lord went down into Egypt, a place that God hates. He hates the world. And he went down into a place that he hates. Why? Because one of his friends went down there and messed up. And God went down yonder after him to bring him out of this mess. Boy, aren't you glad that when we mess up? Amen. How many of y'all messed up before? Amen. Man, have I blown it. Boy, I've messed up. But aren't you so glad when we mess up that God don't shut the lights out and close the door? Aren't you glad God don't crank the bus and say it's over? I'm done. Aren't you glad God didn't hand you a bill of divorcement and say I'm done with you? Aren't you glad when his friends mess up? Aren't you glad God said I'll go to a place that I wouldn't normally go to get my friend back where my friends ought to be? I'm glad we got a God that's a God of a second chance. Amen. I got to tell this story and I'm done. I heard about this blonde convention they were having, don't be mad at me. I used to have blonde hair before it turned gray. And, and so, a uh, blonde convention. So they got together and they said, uh, uh, we're going to prove that blondes are not airheads. So they had this big convention, invited a bunch of blondes, and they said, well, how are we going to prove it? Somebody came up with the idea and said this. Let's go out on the street, find a man. Let's have him come in here and let him ask us any question that he wants to ask. We'll answer it correctly, and that'll prove that blondes are not airheads. They said that's a great idea. So they got went out on the street, brought this man in, said, Sir, you can pick out any blonde in here you want to pick out. Ask them any question that you want to ask. We're here to prove that blondes are not airheads. He said, Okay, I picked that one right there. My question to you, what is the first month of the year? She said, November. And all the other blondes said, Give her another chance. Give her another chance. He's okay with it. What's the capital of the United States? She said, Paris. All those other blondes said, give her another chance. Give her another chance. He said, okay, okay. What's one plus two? She said, one plus one. She said, two. All the other blondes said, give her another chance. <laughs> give her another chance. Aren't you glad when we mess up? We got a God that'll give us another chance. Amen. Give us another chance. I'm here to tell you, friend, when you mess up and you become a failure, let me give you some good advice. Make a trip to the altar. There's a God. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. And he wants to help you.
get out of the mess that you're in. And that's why Abraham went to the altar. Do you need to make a trip to the altar tonight? If you do, can I tell you something? You can feel God right here. You can find grace right here. You can fight guilt right here at the altar. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank God for the altar. Can I have an amen? I'm glad we got an altar. Do you need to come to the altar tonight? There's something going on in your life right now. Y'all just pick it up. Best you can, just pick it up. Walk down one of these aisles. Kneel here at the altar. And feel God. And find grace. And fight guilt. Do you need to come? I just want to tell you. The altar is open. Whatever you might need tonight, you can meet God right here in this place. And whatever it is you need. Hey, you say, preacher, will that solve all my problems? No, sir, and no, ma'am, it won't. But it's a step in the right direction. Let's stand together. Some are coming. Hey, get as close as you can. If you feel like you ought to come, I invite you to come. You know why? Everybody, everybody, Everybody needs to make a trip once in a while to the altar. Maybe you just want to come pray for your church tonight. Hey, come on up here and feel God. Come on up here and find grace. Come on up here and fight that old guilt. Maybe you've blown it early on in your life. Maybe you say, preacher, I let my kids down because I didn't even bring them up in church. And that old guilt hounds you. Hey, best place you can come to fight off guilt is right here at the altar. Amen and amen. We have an altar. Oh, brother, I just want to tell you, God loves you. He loves you so much. He cares about you. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, I just want to tell you, oh, how much he loves you. You say, preacher, how much? So much that he gave his son to die in your place so that he could invite you to become a part of his family. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody needs Jesus. Father, Thank you for the Bible tonight, the Word of God. And right here in our Old Testament is a man who used the altar, made a trip, several trips, to the altar. In every instance, he picked up his burdens, his problems, and he just brought them to the altar. Because this is the place that we feel God, and we find grace, and we fight guilt. And Lord, everybody in this room, needs to feel God, find grace, and fight guilt. Lord, I don't know what all's being prayed about up here tonight. It don't even matter that I know because, Lord, I'm human just like the rest of them are, and I got my battles and struggles and problems and burdens. I got my own baggage I'm toting tonight, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we have a God that can hear and will help the Bible said your hand's not shortened that it cannot save. Your ear's not heavy that it cannot hear. And God, you can work in our lives. And on the basis of those good promises, I just want to invite you tonight on the behalf of my brothers and sisters right here at this altar. I just want to invite you tonight to help them with whatever it is that they're going through. Whatever it is they're praying about right now. I'm so glad you care about us and you love us. And you know what we have need of before we even ask. And yet you still tell us, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. So on the basis of that, we come before you tonight. And God, please, I beg you for mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us, Lord. We all need help. We all struggle. Give us victory and joy. And God, give us revival this week and help us, I pray. In Jesus' name.